Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Erica Sussman, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. Today's conversation comes to you with a great deal of excitement and hope, um, hope for organizational change and institutional change within our advocacy community. We all know that individual advocacy is not um, sustainable without building the infrastructure that is needed to support it and to make it really meaningful in survivors' lives. So, for example, I remember the um, newly minted legal services attorney who was inspired to engage in radical economic advocacy um, that truly met the needs of survivors, but who found herself in an organization that did not support her particularly well. And without the supervision and organizational supports, she was not able to do the work effectively in a way that met her clients' needs. I also think about the countless advocates who are doing economic work each day, but who find themselves um, burnt out. Burnt out because their organizations have not created the space for advocates to do this work, um, so that their economic work is um, seen as an add-on as opposed to a central part of enhancing survivors' access to safety. And then I think more particularly about um, survivors, um, in particular survivors who are from marginalized communities and often face economic barriers to safety. And I think about an immigrant survivor, for example, who cannot access public benefits, or an LGBT survivor who struggles to access shelter um, that she or he finds inaccessible. So the intersecting inequalities that survivors face often require partnerships both within and between organizations and across social justice movements. And that is exactly what our mission is today. Um, this afternoon's webinar will place us on the path toward building institutional change. We'll focus today not just on how um, those other systems um, have issues, although that is a fruitful discussion for another day, but instead we'll focus within. We're going to ask ourselves the question of how can we, the advocacy community, build the organizational infrastructure needed to engage in meaningful survivor-centered economic advocacy, advocacy that enhances the agency of survivors who are connected with many different communities. So to kick us off, I'd like to introduce our very esteemed faculty. I'm thrilled to have them with us today. First is Katie Vondelinde. Um, Katie is a national expert who offers training and education to advocates on issues of economics and survivor-defined advocacy. She's been an expert advisor to CSAJ for over 10 years now, um, and she previously managed the Economic Action Program at Redevelopment Opportunities for Women. She was an assistant director of a DV program in rural southeast Iowa and worked with Building Comprehensive Solutions, where she published lots of work related to domestic violence and economic advocacy. Um, also, Katie right now is an adjunct faculty at Washington University School of Social Work. Um, I'm also happy to introduce our other faculty member joining us today, Pervy Shaw, who is a senior consultant uh, on economic policy and the on the economic policy and leadership project of the Women of Color Network. Um, Pervy is um, inspires change as a nonprofit consultant, anti-violence advocate, and arts activist. In 2008, during her tenure as executive director at Saki for Asian South Asian Women, she won the inaugural Sony Social Service Excellence Award for her leadership fighting violence against women. Um, alongside her work around gender violence, she's taught underserved youth, organized racial justice convenings, and spearheaded policy change around language access. During her seven and a half years as ED at Saki, she enabled increased language access in New York State and enhanced approaches to ending violence. She's been asked to provide expert commentary on violence against women um, and the South Asian community by a range of broadcast and print media. 
So I am thrilled to have both of you with us today, both Katie and Pervy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for I'm inviting going to, us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to hand the program back to Sarah to tell you a little bit about some of the logistical pieces, and then we'll dive right into the substance. Yeah, thanks, Erica, and hello all, and thanks again to Katie and Pervy. Just a couple of notes as we um, get going here today. This webinar is being recorded, which is great because we will make sure to have the recording and all the materials discussed here today available on our website for you all within 48 hours, so by Friday. Also, um, if you're here, you have registered, so you'll also receive a direct email from me with the materials letting you know um, that everything is up and, and where you can find it and all of that. Um, just to let you know, if you haven't started playing around already um, about the platform, um, Take a look at this word bubble um, icon in the lower right-hand toolbar and chat with all participants. Katie is going to be asking for your engagement throughout the webinar, so I encourage you to, to use that um, to, to chat with each other and to ask questions. And um, feel free to start right now. Let us know, um, introduce yourself. Let me know who you are, where you're coming from, and Tell us how spring is going for you right now. It's a beautiful day mm -hmm. here in Brooklyn. Let me know if it's the same or if you're still dealing with a little bit of shaking off, shaking off the winter a little bit. Um, and while you do that, um, a final note is to, if you have any issues, feel free to use that hand icon in the middle of your screen and that will let me know that you're having an issue. You can also send me, Sarah, um, the host, um, a private chat um, that I can try to help you troubleshoot. Also, if you go to the event info tab uh, um, above the PowerPoint slides, that should give you your call in and different login information. And sometimes if you are having technical difficulty, the best thing is just to log out um, and log back in and call in and all of that stuff. But I will be here to help you. Um, but I hope that everyone is easily able to listen and engage with us. Um, and feel free to ask questions at any time. We're going to gather them and keep a hold of them so we can present them to Katie and Corby at the very end. Um, but don't, don't, don't think that you have to hold them. Let them, let them fly as you're also talking with, with one another. So with that, let me know what's going on. And it's great to see so many people from so many places and that it's gorgeous <laughs> everywhere. Um, <laughs> But with that, I'm going to keep that going. I'm going to pass it back to Erica to, to give a sense of uh, the bigger picture of, of where this training fits with, with our work. So back to you, Erica. Great. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. It's nice to see all of you popping up, and I recognize many names. And um, if I haven't said so already, um, we really do envision today's program as an opportunity for all of us to be able to learn from one another. Um, there's very rich expertise collectively on this webinar, and so we really do hope that you'll share your um, perspective, your challenges, your successes, so that we can all make this um, a really productive and full uh, learning experience today. So um, I want to talk a little bit about CSAJ and where this work is coming from. Um, for some of you may not have heard this and some of you may. So CSAJ um, is a national organization that's been around for about 10 years now. Um, and our mission is to promote advocacy approaches that remove systemic barriers enhance organizational responses, and improve professional practices to meet the self-defined needs of domestic and sexual violence survivors. Um, our broader vision is really about equal access, access to physical safety, economic security, and human dignity. And so today's um, webinar in that way is very much in line with that broader vision because what we hope to do in thinking about organizational structure is to um, think about it in the context of removing some of those systemic barriers and creating uh, institutional approaches that are geared toward that end. Today's uh, webinar is part of a project that um, we have called the Consumer Rights for Domestic and Sexual Violence Survivors Initiative. 
It's a national project that um, enhances economic justice for survivors by building the capacity of lawyers and advocates to provide consumer and economic civil legal advocacy. And that also engages in systems advocacy to remove barriers to economic security. We began this work back in 2007 with some funding through the Office on Violence, uh, Office for Victims of Crime. And at that time, it really um, actually began with an awareness of partnership building. Um, that, that launched project was all about um, building partnerships between um, advocacy communities that had not really done a particularly good job of sharing expertise and perspectives. Um, and so that really is um, where this work sprang from. We then became, became a technical assistance project funded through the Office on Violence Against Women um, that began in 2011 and is, is where this project currently sits. Um, we have lots and lots of partners that are involved in this work and, and that make it so rich. Um, some of those partners are the National Consumer Law Center, <clears throat> excuse me, Home Free, which is uh, based out of Portland, Oregon, um, the Center for Court Innovation in New York City, Wider Opportunities for Women out of D.C., as well as a cadre of expert advisors like our two faculty who are joining us today. I want to talk real generally about some of our activities because you may be interested in uh, doing a little bit of research afterwards or reaching out to us to get some more information. One is that um, as a result of a lot of the technical assistance work and the hands-on intensive um, community contextual work that we've done around economics, um, it became really clear to us that um, advocates and programs were interested in some tools that were going to help them to better address the economic and consumer needs of survivors. And so we are right now in the midst of developing what we're calling a consumer and economic civil legal guidebook for lawyers and advocates. Um, so you should definitely stay tuned for that. It will be a comprehensive resource that covers a range of different topics, but that thinks about them really concretely in terms of um, the needs of domestic violence survivors and how that impacts um, strategies as well as needs. We also produce a bunch of webinars like the one that you're participating in today, and all of our webinars are archived up on our website. Um, right here are a bunch that are fairly recent and may be of particular interest. We also provide individualized technical assistance. So what that means is that if you are um, grappling with either a, uh, an issue that involves a particular client or something within your community or your organization around achieving economic justice for survivors, um, you can contact us and we can draw upon the cadre of experts that we have working with us to kind of problem solve with you. And then lastly, this will be addressed in much greater depth later on, so I don't want to talk about it too much right now, but one of, I think, the most exciting and transformative pieces of this consumer rights project is the demonstration site work that we do with a handful of communities across the U.S., um, all of whom do a very deep dive into um, identifying their gaps um, and the opportunities for better meeting the economic needs of survivors. And all of the demonstration sites that we're currently working with are, are listed here. Um, lastly, I just want to make a quick announcement. One of the other resources that we're very excited about is our, our um, Accounting for Economic Security Atlas. Um, and it is just about to be released um, later, um, well, in the middle of next month, we're preparing to release it. it. The purpose is to provide service providers in understanding, navigating, and changing the economic terrain that survivors traverse on their paths to safety. And the first map book, book has been drafted and is uh, we're getting ready to send it out to the universe. But really what it is, um, is drawing from um, many um, different advisors, actually both of the faculty today um, were um, involved in this, and um, it, 
its intention is to provide a, a framework for addressing the economic needs of survivors globally. And then um, the two map books that will follow will provide more concrete types of solutions, both on the individual as well as the community and systems change level. So very excited about the release of that, probably around April 15th. Okay, with all of that as background, I'd like to hand the program over to Katie Von Delinde right now, who will talk with us today about effective survivor-centered economic advocacy in organizational context. Hello all, thank you so much for, for logging in. It's really exciting to be able to do this. I know Erica framed really well, I think, why we're doing this work. Um, but for me, I just wanted to say, as, as, in addition to what Erica was saying, I have also provided training to folks around the country who have said, oh, I'm so excited about this work. And as Erica said, they get back to the doing the work and haven't felt supported. So what we are really gonna be focusing on today is how we make our organizations places where organizational economic advocacy is supported. So the way that I thought that we could start with this is looking at our objectives that we wanted to really figure out what is the difference between survivor-centered economic advocacy at the individual level and what is it at the organizational level. We're also gonna be talking about evidence that supports the importance and effectiveness of this work. We're gonna have you talk a little bit about your context and the work that you're already doing what we found is that as we talk to, to advocates around the country, um, and we're starting to talk about economic work, as they start looking at this, they realize they're already doing a lot of the work. And so then we can just try to sort of fit that into the framework of survivor-centered work. Um, we're also going to be talking about key ways to effectively increase the work that's being done in an organization, and then apply strategies for that work within your own organizational context. For me, it always is helpful to start this work and thinking about this at, by thinking about a survivor. So I wanted to frame the beginning of our work thinking about a woman um, that, were, that is named Gloria. So I want you to just take a moment, close your eyes, and think a little bit about Gloria. Gloria is a woman that um, was with an abusive partner for over 10 years. Her partner, Fred, they were married. and. During that time that they were together, Fred was very controlling of the money. He lied um, continually about paying bills and would say that he would take care of things and wouldn't. And so Gloria was able to, to leave Fred about a year ago and is now within Transitional Housing Center. She has had some fear because he has tried to track her in the past, but she currently is feeling fairly safe in the location that she's in, but doesn't want to alert him about where she might be. But now Gloria has some additional challenges that she's dealing with. She is receiving phone calls from debt collectors, and she doesn't recognize the debts that they are calling and talking to her about. She's also really confused because she's actually trying to find her own housing now in an apartment, and she has um, really good back um, rental history, but she's having a challenge finding housing due to her credit. But she hasn't seen her credit report in several years and doesn't really know what is on there. She also doesn't currently have a bank account. She does have a store a credit card in her name. So many years ago, she opened a store credit card at Macy's and she still has that. And she also has a job. She's a preschool teacher. But she, despite the fact that she has um, a very strong educational background and many years of experience, more years of experience doing preschool teaching than other colleagues at her workplace, she's been turned down for a promotion to being a lead teacher. And she's very concerned that she's not, she's being overlooked for this promotion due to her race. And although there's other African American staff members at the organization, there are no other African American leaders in leadership positions. And she's concerned that this is because of racism. She's not being given this job. So she is Gloria. Imagine that Gloria is coming to you. So what I want you to think about is what might Gloria need? In, in thinking about how she would evaluate what she would need, how would she also evaluate her risks and her safety? And if she came to you and to your, or to your organizational context, somebody within your organization, would she be able to get help with what she needed? And that may depend on what she's saying she needs. So if she decided that she prioritized that she wanted to open a bank account, could she do that within your organization? Could she get help around um, her fear about being denied the position because of her race? 
Could she have help around finding housing because of the credit issues? Could she get help finding out what was wrong with her credit? Just thinking about that, would Glory be able to get those things from your organization? And even if she would, would she know that she was able to get that? How would she be able to know? If she went on the website of your organization, would she know that you provided some of those services? Would she know because of word of mouth, because of different people that have been helped from your organization or, or from different folks that have worked with you? Or would she know from a referral? And is there any other ways that Gloria may know of what is provided within your organization? So thinking about that and thinking about Gloria's situation, I want to frame this in this idea of what is this survivor-centered economic advocacy in the organizational context. And how we're defining that today is by looking at organizations or programs that respond to a broad range of risks in a survivor's life in an effort to work towards, a safer, towards the survivor's effort to be safer. So we know that we can't guarantee safety for any survivors, um, but what we want to do is look at how we can help this person create more safety within their lives. And so we're responding as an organization to the impact of the intimate partner violence, to the physical, emotional, psychological, sexual, economic needs, but also to the economic justice needs. So the financial issues that may be a result of what some of the things that the partner has done, but also maybe a result of the person's life risks. For example, might be because they have low educational attainment or live in a community where there isn't a lot of employment options, or maybe financial challenges resulting from other forms of oppression, from racism, from transphobia, from other things that are making it more difficult for this person to have some economic justice in their lives. And so our organizations that are being survivor-centered are working towards this, this, these larger goals, these larger life goals that will help move towards safety. So survivor-centered economic advocacy in, recognizes that there is not, we cannot have survivors that have safety without having economic justice. And that doing economic advocacy without paying attention to the safety and privacy of survivors is not effective. So we know that there are folks out there in our communities that do economic work that are doing credit counseling or that are doing other sorts of economic work, but that if, if we are working with survivors and we're not looking at how perhaps budgeting or looking at a credit report may put them at greater risk of safety by doing that, um, we may be putting people at greater risk. But we also know that we have to do that this work has to be supported within an organizational context to increase that safety. So how will we know if, we're, if we are an organization that's supporting survivor-centered economic advocacy? So this slide gives us some goals and ideas about what it might look like. And you may actually even want to use some of these as an evaluation tool as you're looking at your, at your work and saying, are we doing this in a way that is, survi that is survivor-centered? So what we would know is if, if we were providing survivor-centered economic advocacy, a diverse array of survivors would feel like they can get something from, from your organization. They, they can get there, something that's being offered there that they will have an increased long-term safety, both physical and economic. We also see that the policies and protocols of the organization support survivor-centered economic advocacy work, and, and we'll look at some examples of those in a bit. We also know that, that in organizations for their survivor-centered economic advocacy, lawyers and advocates that are doing this work will feel supported, and they will then therefore be more likely to support survivors' choices, that they will be happier with their jobs, and they will be more likely to continue doing their jobs. Um, we also see that uh, survivor-centered organizations will be aware of the community economic needs, strengths, and partners. And they'll value that, um, and the information gained from individual work will inform policy. So we're talking about this today, this idea of survivor-centered economic advocacy, but what's the difference between individual and organizational work? The individual work is going to be the one-on-one -on -one work or group work that done with survivors. It could be, but not limited to, things such as economic planning, credit advocacy, tax advocacy, so the things that you're doing with survivors are on economics. But if we're looking at an organizational survivor centered economic advocacy, what this looks like is that all levels of the organization, from volunteers to board members to executive directors, understand the connection between domestic violence and poverty and want to do something about that. 
that organizations have protocols, policies, and practices that supportive of and informed by individual survivor-centered economic work, and that they will, will be more likely to partner with a diverse array of communities, members of community partners. So there's more information that um, you can find about building partnerships, and we'll be talking about that in just a little bit, but there's a link to a report by the Center of Survivor Agency and Justice on the bottom of this slide. So what we might be helpful for us now is kind of thinking for you all, if you could respond in the chat, of what is your organizational context? Where do you work? What kind of work are you doing? Um, are you at a community, community domestic violence organization, community anti-poverty organization, a legal service organization? Are you providing technical ass uh, assistance? Where, what kind of work are you doing? That will help us. Oh, so I see we have some people from um, legal services organizations. So we'll continue to look at, at where you're coming from as we are looking at the, this work. Oh, another University Clock Clinic. So we had see some domestic violence organizations. Yeah, there's so some community-based organizations and some um, clinics located within law schools as well. So a diverse awesome. range of different contexts shelters as yeah, well. We think it's really helpful for you to think about your own context as you're thinking about this work and what might be important for your own context. So if you look at our, our next slide, we really see this beautiful visual that um, was created by Survivor, the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice around the connection between domestic violence and poverty. Um, my guess is that I'm speaking to people that are very aware of this connection. And, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide specifically, but we wanted to give you a lot of this information so that you can use this as evidence support the work as you're trying to support organizational change within your context. Um, we know that you know, poverty increases the risk of violence, that if we look at that, those numbers up on the top, that 25% um, of all women reporting abuse are experiencing poverty. And, and homeless women, within that, there's 50% of women are, are experiencing homelessness. And that women that are receiving public welfare benefits, of those women, uh, around 70% are reporting abuse. And we're just looking at women with fewer options, fewer choices, um, and that they are more likely to, to be dealing with issues of poverty. We also know that survivors that are living in poverty have, have more risk. And there's a lot of reasons why, and we'll talk just about a few today, um, but as I said, we're not going to spend too much time on this um, as a result of Probably a lot of you have a lot of this awareness, but we'll let you know that in some of um, the handouts that you will be receiving, you'll be getting some specific detailed numbers and actual statistics that you can use um, as you're doing this work. Um, but we know that women that are, or folks that are experiencing poverty um, are, are exposed to more risks. They're risk of physical violence, but they're also risk, dealing with risk associated with poverty and with fewer options. Um, and then we know that safety planning strategies require a lot of life changes and that that women, some women with low income are, just simply don't have the resources required to fulfill uh, um, a lot of safety plans. Um, we also know that folks that are struggling with, with poverty may not prioritize physical safety because of the issues of poverty are so acute for them at that moment. So for example, if somebody is really dealing with needing to keep their house and, and wanting to stay in a school district for their children, they may prioritize that versus um, leaving an abusive partner because that is what they need to do at that time. So survivors living in poverty may be more likely to remain in contact and that there may be more consequences for them um, if, they are, if their abusive partners are receiving consequences. For example, if they're receiving jail time, there may be more consequences in terms of poverty for the actual survivor themselves. So um, a few years ago, Erica um, worked on an article with um, Sarah Schoner looking at the economic ripple effect of IPV, and I would love for Erica to talk about this briefly. Oh, sure. So um, what, what we are talking about when we refer to the economic ripple effect is um, just the fact that many times when we're talking about economic hardship resulting from abuse, we think about it um, in a sort of um, incident-based way, um, you know, a particular medical bill that resulted from um, an abusive circumstance or perhaps um, um, damage to physical property or damage to, de uh, damage to credit even. Um, however, we know that 
the economic impacts of intimate partner violence are long ranging and ripple throughout the life course and that they often are um, compounding the impact of poverty which of course in turn increases vulnerability to future violence. So this graphic right here tries to demonstrate um, some of those rippling impacts, you know, from the time um, that somebody is in a relationship, they may experience um, economic harms that look like credit damage or debt or missed days of work. Um, as they leave a relationship, they may incur the costs of relocation, for example, or legal fees. Then further um, in time, they may experience um, huge costs of housing instability and um, other costs associated with independent living. And then really when you look in the long term, um, we're talking about um, much more significant economic impacts that um, are harder to traverse, such as um, slowed professional development as a result of having to drop out of school or not go to work um, as a result of the abuse, all of which, of course, um, leads to increased vulnerability to future violence. So that is the concept of the economic ripple effect. And when we um, think about that, I think it has um, pretty huge implications for how we approach our interventions. Thank you, Erica. So when we look at this whole picture of the connection between intimate partner violence and economics, and we know that not only does intimate partner violence impact a survivor's economic life over time, and we also know that economic abuse is a specific strategy used within the context of intimate partner violence, it seems very important for us to be responding to those needs and, and economics. But it also is very important uh, how we respond to those needs. Um, we found lately that there, that there has been some evidence showing that when we look at this work and we we focus it within this context of survivor-centered work that we are actually more effective in creating long-term change. So survivor-centered advocacy is really employing advocacy efforts that are directed by the survivor's needs and by what the survivor is prioritizing in terms of their safety in a very broad aspect of what safety looks like. And we have some evidence from researchers that's showing that survivors who work with advocates who are survivor-centered, who are being guided by what the survivor is wanting and needing, um, with, and not being directive in their advocacy, but providing support, education, partnerships with the advocate, that the, there is more progress. So we see that those survivors have less difficulty obtaining resources over time. So even after they leave their advocate relationship, they're still more likely to be able to contact and reach out and connect with other organizational researchers. We also found that, um, especially Alan, Alan and colleagues have found that they, that survivors with survivor-centered advocates actually experience less violence over time, which actually the um, authors were, were surprised about because we know that the, the survivor themselves doesn't have a lot of um, agency over whether or not they experience abuse. Um, and, and so the fact that survivor-centered advocacy was, was a piece of this was, was very um, hopeful. We also know that survivors that um, have advocates that are kind of listening to what they're doing and moving from there report that they have a higher quality of life. They are more satisfied with the systems that they come in, in, in contact with, including police officers, the justice system, which may be important for a lot of us in the legal system, um, for re residential work, community-based work. Survivors are also saying that they have less depressive symptoms and actually have a greater quality of life over time. Um, and again, this uh, Pat and Neon Goodman found um, re reduced repeat abuse after having a survivor-centered advocate. And that advocate, the, excuse me, the survivors also report having more optimism and more tools, internal tools. They feel like they have more ideas about what to do when they come up with challenges as a result of having a survivor-centered advocate. So putting these things together, the, the, the really importance of doing economic work and doing it in a certain way that is, that is survivor-driven, we see real ability to create long-term change within the lives of survivors. So what would be helpful for us now, again, we'd love to see in your chat of what 
when you think about your organization, what sort of survivor-centered economic advocacy work are you already doing? And if you could give us some examples in the chat, and we'll kind of refer to those as we continue to talk through, it'd be really helpful. So for the next part of the um, webinar, we're going to talk about how do we really do this work. We're going to look at needs assessment. We're going to talk about leadership. We're going to talk about capacity of organizations to do the work. Um, we're going to look at building and diversifying partnerships um, within the context of, of doing supported um, economic advocacy work. Let's see, anybody, oh, we see some people are responding with what they're doing. Some rental yeah, some folks assistance. are talking, yeah, right. job Go skills ahead. work, um, credit related work, budgeting, um, rental and security fee assistance. What We've else? I know that many folks, yeah. We've got some organizing, doing, um, finding non-traditional jobs to raise wages, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Some work around identity theft which of course has huge economic implications. Debt, I see tax. somebody saying organizing for non-traditional jobs to raise wages, awesome work. Mm. Some legal work around debt, tax, housing, and student loans, which is wonderful. Workforce development. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Lots of good work. So it's, it's, it's really helpful to see all the amazing work that's being done. And, and hopefully by, by seeing kind of how um, in maybe your organization is further ahead or, or not as far as you would like it to be, but you can see within the context of, of the work that you're already doing that this is awesome and that you're already really well on the way. Um, so the next piece that we're going to talk about is needs assessment. And so I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Wee uh, or to talk about um, what's been happening and the work that she's been doing with um, Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. Sure, absolutely. Excuse me, and thanks, Katie. I'm going to try, for the purposes here, to provide a brief overview of really how to think about needs assessment. Um, and Katie set this up beautifully, um, so I'm going to try to link it to some of the goals of survivor-centered economic advocacy that she presented through her rich review of the research, um, and then give an example or an illustration of how one of our demonstration sites has really used assessment to support economic work um, throughout their organization. Um, a little caveat as we go forward, um, sometimes the word needs can be a little problematic, because um, I don't know about you, but for me, whenever someone asks me, what's the need or what do you need, what's needed here, I tend to give a solution rather than a problem, define a problem. We need training, we need resources, we need so-and-so to do better, we need the judge to make these decisions. Um, and while that's great and I may be correct, um, it doesn't allow us to fully step back and examine all of my options when it is time to make solutions. So what we're really trying to ask is, what's the problem here? And by problem, um, I tend to mean, what, what's the gap? Is there a gap that we're seeing? And what that is very simply is the difference between what is and what should be. So in a very oversimplified way, um, despite this being kind of cute, um, we can see that there's a problem here with what is versus what should be. Um, from our perspective, uh, as well as from what I imagine the elephant is going through, this looks like a much better scenario. But how do we get to here from where we are currently? Um, and in this example, the problem may seem pretty clear, but the process is, is no less important and is helpful in envisioning our work. And so what assessment does um, is it can help us not only name what we're currently doing um, in terms of economic work, but figure out what some of the specific needs of survivors are in our community, and then compare those things um, and link those gaps up with some of the root causes that we know or that we see might be related to a bunch of different things to help drive some of our actions. Um, and required in this work is really quite simply some reflection, reflection on ourselves, um, reflecting on our collective work and reflecting on our community. So um, just as I said, rather than offering up solutions right away, 
it's sort of practicing how to shelve those for a minute and pose questions um, that we can really facilitate some brainstorming. And in brainstorming, there are many different ways that we can um, conjure up ideas, and I'm sure we, we all know, but it is important to have lots of different stakeholders at the table. From there, we can really seek evidence for what we know already exists or even what we assume um, is probably occurring. Um, we're all, and you all, are sitting on incredible expertise and experience and even data about where your current efforts are going. So sometimes it's a matter of um, digging up um, some of that gold that we're, that we're sitting on. And then just as Katie laid out for us in that story of what's the problem and how is poverty linked um, to violence and what are the negative outcomes of that, we can look to theory, whether it's research, whether it's the law, whether it's a policy, um, whether it's our own experience and how we are positioning and saying that our organization does work. And then from there, we can kind of figure out what are the unanswered questions and go asking those questions in the community, whether it's to a survivor or to a group of advocates or to another service or community um, provider um, that, that we need to talk with. And this is a way to really turn these questions um, and turn some of our probing to reanalyze and think about um, some of these questions. And then with all of that, we then kind of, then we get to summarize and pull those ideas off the shelf and see if our stories um, kind of logically line up. Um, and a way that we can kind of gauge that is through this whole process um, is to keep in mind context as well as the level that we're operating on. So, for example, if you're pulling together a team to do an assessment or to start evaluating your work in a different way, the power dynamics or relationships um, or the different levels of experience within that group um, could obviously influence how people engage in that group, which will influence the questions being asked, which will influence the answers that you receive. Um, that's important to keep in mind, just as we all know that our political environment can immediately shift the experiences of survivors as well as our organizational funding, um, what is possible and what's not. Um, and so not just being aware of that, but really acknowledging and saying that out loud as we do this work is really critical, as is understanding where we're operating. Are we seeing a gap between the way that advocates or attorneys are interacting with survivors directly, so that's an interpersonal level, or are we seeing an issue with the way that the courts are um, operating in our community, which is a completely different task when we look at that. Um, so this, the requirements of assessment are, are this, but at the end of the day, you're really already doing the work. In my experience, you're experts in self-reflection and re-examination. And so I hope that when I was going through those requirements, they kind of resonated with, yeah, I'm doing that. I think about that. Um, and it's all to say that assessment isn't necessarily this outside thing that we need to tack on to what we're doing and throw a ton of resources on. Sometimes it's a matter of reformalizing the process a little bit and in a different way so that we can gather and assess some trends. Um, so, for example, here I've laid out some indicators that I put together from all that research that Katie mentioned that are sort of indicators for effective survivor-centered economic advocacy based on the research. These may be questions you're already asking of survivors, you're already asking of advocates, they may be new, um, but they kind of represent ways to measure or count what should be. Um, and you can see that you can then, in some cases, put the different experiences, experiences in conversation with one another. So are survivors and advocates seeing the same things? Do they perceive the needs to be similar? Um, are their experiences with services or systems um, about on par? Um, are there perceptions of the outcomes of different things? in line, and then you can go deeper with survivors' experiences in the long term, as well as how advocates are feeling about being supported at work. And if you put all of that together um, and look at what you're already asking and already doing, you can kind of see those gaps emerging there. And sometimes you'll see a match, sometimes you might see a little mismatch. Um, and to what extent are both survivors and advocates for example, reporting some issues when they're um, doing credit repair, 
um, but maybe they're seeing a different barrier to this problem that kind of directs you in sleuthing a little bit more about what might be underlying that, that you can fix it and better match the work that's going on. Um, in other cases, there might be a big mismatch, so like a square peg round hole kind of a mismatch. Um, are they not seeing the same needs at all? Um, or is someone providing a service and thinks it's really successful, but you're seeing consistent barriers, um, let's say in employment, even though you're doing job training, survivors are having a really tough time finding employment or sustainable wages. What's behind that question? So, of course, I'm talking about the advocate-survivor relationship here, but this goes beyond that, which is, again, why it's rooting assessment in survivors' lived experiences so we can really visualize all the people and institutions they may be interacting with is, is really important, um, which leads us to a similar illustration. Um, the SHA has been doing some pilot site and demonstration site work for many years now. Um, and in this work, in this last year, we really worked with sites in very different contexts um, to assess survivors' needs for the purposes of identifying both advocacy and systems level changes. So as I mentioned before, doing both an intersectional approach as well as a multi-level or an ecological um, analysis of what's going on. Um, and I'm gonna, we gave them, we kind of developed with them different tools for brainstorming, different methods for gathering data and different means for interpreting that, that data and, and fleshing out the, the various opportunities that were available and relevant in their context. So I'm gonna use um, Women's Resource Center as a quick example, um, who some of their staff may be on um, the call with us today, so I welcome everyone to ask more detailed questions and we'll make sure to have more information. Um, this project is head up by Carol Schoner as well as uh, Jody Lewis there at Women's Resource Center. And what they did is because we had worked with them previously as pilot sites really building partnerships in terms of brainstorming, we used a strategic planning tool that many may be familiar with. It's called a SWOT analysis, standing for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats as a way to gather up past um, insights and experience and couple it with the purpose of their work going forward um, to really assist that brainstorming process. Through that work, Carol and Jody really thought that it was a great tool, so why not turn that into a survey to ask, help answer some of their new questions that were emerging. So we did that, and they delivered the survey both to advocates as well as to survivors. So similar to what I said earlier, this really, they did this um, very purposefully. They wanted to put the perceptions and the work in dialogue what did advocates already know and do around various economic or consumer issues, and what were survivors saying that they were struggling with, even over time, um, if they were connected? Um, how had their needs changed, and were they still being met? Um, and they met with this data that they've then gathered survivors in this group to help interpret the findings. Um, and then finally, um, which was a really nice way to go in depth um, into even more questions, do some more brainstorming that they could bring back to their final, um, back to their economic advocacy team to take stock, to see what they were doing, and establish priorities going forward. And so you can see in this feedback column how Carol and Jody described the process itself um, having value in how their organization approached economic work. Um, it really act as a, acted as a convener amongst all the staff and the various roles within their organization, as well as with partners. Um, in addition, and importantly, really lifting up the voices of survivors and creating that dialogue. And then as you can see in the final bullet point, they really said that it led to improved assessment of economic abuse amongst advocates, increased their knowledge of available resources, advanced their system advocacy strategies, and help develop new partnerships they needed to create. So it really provided clarity for the road ahead. Um, and in addition, they now have some data that they can carry with them as they're asking and seeking some of these changes. Um, and so this is a, a one example and very specific tools that were employed um, in this process. Um, 
And so I'm just going to list them out here and note in the tools section um, that, again, this is one process and one illustration, and there are lots of different ways to go about brainstorming and data collection. And we probably all have some experience with survey design, and it's not as easy as it seems. And so um, a couple of tools are, are one. Us here at CSAJ are happy to provide some technical assistance as you approach this work. We also have um, a national needs assessment from 2012 that looks at um, gaps very broadly that can help you think about and go deeper into whether and how those gaps might exist in your context, as well as the building partnerships report from our pilot phase and looking at the process and some really insightful lessons learned from that that work, and we will be kind of laying out um, Women's Resource Center as well as other experiences and needs assessment in a toolkit um, that will be forthcoming. Um, so that's sort of a big picture, I hope, of how we can think about it, and I hope um, you're making connections for different activities or groups or forums that you already have that might be a really useful platform for thinking in a new way about the reflection um, and the assessment. That, that you do on a day-to-day. -day. With that, Excellent. Thank I'm you. going to turn it back to Katie. Thank you, Sarah. So Sarah gave us a really great framework of how to do some needs assessment work to really support our survivor-centered economic advocacy. We're going to shift a little bit in talking about leadership support and how to get leaders involved and invested in survivor-centered economic advocacy. So I want you to think about to, we're going to talk about two different types of leaders within your organization. We're going to talk about both thought leaders and action leaders. So I am thinking about thought leaders as people who really cause you to think about things in a different way. So maybe somebody that can ask you one question and all of a sudden you see things in a new way. Oh, it sheds light on something that you've never thought of before. Or, for example, somebody that maybe sends you some articles that helps you think about new things. And oftentimes these leaders can be in different parts of our organization. So it could be executive directors, that's who sometimes we traditionally think of as thought leaders within organizations, but it can be board members, it can be funders that are helping us think about things in new ways. It could be staff members, it could be community partners. It could be survivors within our organization. It could be volunteers. So it could be all sorts of different folks. And if we're wanting to engage these people that help other people think about things in new ways, there may be some strategies for doing that. So one of the ways that we might engage those folks is by supplying some evidence, showing them some of the stuff we've talked about today, why survivor-centered advocacy works, why economic work is important with survivors of um, of domestic violence. We also might provide some case examples. It could be case examples of survivors who have, who have um, had changes in their lives based on economic advocacy done in a, in a way that was supportive, or maybe examples of other organizations that have had some success. So hopefully after the webinar today, you'll have some ideas of different organizations that are doing new and innovative and exciting things around economics. Um, you may actually just go back to your own mission or your vision of your organization. Um, many of us work in organizations that include safety as a part of our mission or our vision, or empowerment, um, or legal justice. And all of these things are key components of economic justice work. And so we can look at how our own mission, our own vision, is already framed to, be, to situate us perfectly to be doing survivor-centered economic work. We also may look to national leaders within our domestic violence movement, within the legal services movement, within the justice movement, who are saying that this is important and this is something we need to do. So providing articles, um, listening to folks that are out there in the, in the nation um, that are saying things. Listen to folks like, like Purvi Shah, who we'll hear from today, and Erica Sussman, and other leaders within our, uh, our movement and outside of our movement that are looking at economics and, sur and survivor-centered work as something that's key to the work that we're doing. We also need to think about how, we, how do we provide pathways. So if we have thought leaders within our organization, as I was saying earlier, like survivors or volunteers or maybe staff members, or maybe we have somebody that answers the phones at our organization that is really somebody that shapes some of the work that we do, how do we give them avenues to help um, have them talk to people like our boards or, or to our community funders to help them see and think about this in different ways? 
and um, and how do they they give the, that example and ways to do that? So I'm going to talk about some ways that I have seen done that has been powerful um, in the work that I've seen. So I was had the opportunity to work um, in the state of Iowa, and where we years ago now convened economic summits in three communities where we invited community partners. We invited our, all of our domestic violence staff, all of the community members that were in, excited and engaged in this work, but we also invited partners who we weren't currently working with but knew may be important to this work, and we talked about the stuff that some of the things that Sarah was talking about, what are our needs, what do we really need within our community, and how can we partner to, with each other to do this work. It allowed for funders to talk with our board members, and it allowed for survivors to talk with different folks within the community, and it made a really deep and meaningful conversation that then engaged us in different economic work. Also, um, at an organization where I used to work, we had a lot of board and in-service retreats where we invited staff members and volunteers and survivors to talk with the board so there was more communication and talking about this economic needs and, and resources. Um, also, within at, in St. Louis, where I currently live, we had an, ec an economic conference where we invited, instead of having a summit where it was more of a conversation, it was more of a training situation where we invited community partners, domestic violence folks, funders to learn more about economic justice and also to learn more about survivor-centered work. So those are three examples of ways that you could get more support from thought leaders. We also know that there are leaders that actually create change within an organization because of the things that they do. And when other people see them doing these things, they think, oh my gosh, I want to do that too. That seems really effective. Oftentimes, those are our program directors or supervisors within our organizations, but it also, again, can be people that we don't necessarily initially think of as, as a key leader. But if we look at really um, how, what creates organizational change, we can look at ideas such as what they're using within the Green Dot um, movement is to look at who are leaders within different segments. So while it may be a program director, it may also be, as I was talking about before, it may be the receptionist who's answering the phone. Um, and so kind of engaging all those people in different ways by creating, changing protocols, encouraging um, people to look at the use and needs assessments by providing good supervision and, or by providing economic training to every part of your organization. Um, so again, just some examples of some action leaders um, within redevelopment opportunities for women. Staff members are all encouraged to present topics or trainings at staff meetings. It doesn't have to come from program directors. It could come from somebody that is an advocate or somebody who is um, providing assessment needs, and so they can bring what they're interested in to the staff meeting. And that staff members at all levels are also provided economic training. It's not just happening at the, econ at the advocate level, but also at the program director, the executive director, and the, the board members, so they also are familiar with the economic work. Um, and also helping advocates we have, t have tools to gather and continue to look at, as Sarah was talking about with the, with the needs assessment, kind of paying attention to what are some of the trends they're seeing from survivors, about what they're needing, about what's working for them, what are they asking about, and are we able to respond them so, so that we can share that information internally to create programs, trainings, and partnerships that are more responsive to the economic needs of survivors. So moving from leadership, we're also wanting to think about how do we how do we increase our capacity within the organization in terms of our goals and evaluation, and then also within our protocols. Thinking about the strategic goals and thinking about where your organization is or your context is and what you're moving towards, it may be helpful to ask some questions about your organization and thinking about currently how does survivor-centered economic advocacy fit into your mission or vision. Do, do you come from a broad idea of safety? When you're responding to safety needs of survivors, is that generally looking more at physical safety, um, emotional safety, or are we looking at economic safety as well? How are your organizational um, strategic goals connected to survivors' long-term economic safety? And then how does your evaluation capture some of this work that's being done? And what kind of work is valued within your, your um, context? 
So my next chat question for you are is thinking about within your context of where you're working, what kind of work do you think is valued that is done with survivors? And how can you tell that that, that, that is work is, is valued? For example, is the work that you're doing to create, get orders of protection, is that valued? Is um, counseling, is that valued? And kind of thinking about within your organization and how do you know that? The reason I'm, I'm wondering this and I think about it a lot is sometimes I talk to advocates and they say, well, I'm really trying to, um, to, to talk to survivors about economics, but they don't seem to want to talk to me about it or that's not something that they're coming to us for. Um, and I wonder sometimes if, if survivors understand um, that that's when we, how we ask questions to survivors about what they need and even thinking if survivors thinking, am I going to be able to get help? with my economic needs? Does this advocate have the skills? Does this person I'm working with know how to help me with this um, and, and these needs? Anybody thinking about the kind of work that's valued in your context? There, you continue to look at, at that and I'm gonna go to the strategic goals. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that you wanna be thinking about within this work is, what, what impact do we want to see? If we're doing survivor-centered economic advocacy work, how will we know? How will we know what doing is working for us? How will we know if we're causing this change? And how do we, are we intentionally listening to advocates and to survivors? So um, some examples of strategic goals that may be capturing some of this survivor-centered economic work is looking at um, are we increasing economic safety as defined, defined by specific survivors? So it could be um, credit scores. Um, is a survivor interested in improving their credit score? Is it reducing the amount of um, instability in their employment? Um, are we looking at creating effective cost of living plans? So many times advocates are asked to do budgeting with survivors but aren't given the skills or training to do that. And so are, if we're looking at, are we creating cost of living plans that are meaningful for survivors, that are helpful in their context as they're planning for safety within their work. Um, so those might be a part of our strategic goals. We also might include increasing a survivor's sense of capacity to make economic choices in their lives. So looking at their own self-determination around economics. We might be looking at their economic knowledge and what that is, how that is improving within their work. We also might look at how are we increasing survivors' understanding of economic systems and structure. So oftentimes um, we see that uh, survivors maybe not understand um, the whole context of power and money within our society. And so we have a lot of folks that I've worked with who feel very shameful or it's their fault that they're poor um, and they really, they, they look at themselves and there's a lot of beating themselves up around that. Um, and part of the work that we might be doing in terms of our strategic goal planning is how do we help survivors understand the context within their struggling for poverty so that it's not such a thing that they're seeing within themselves but that they're fitting within this economic structure. I see that some of you have responded to kind of what you are, um, the kind of work that's valued in your context. Do you want, Sarah, can you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? I, I'm, this is Erica. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in a little bit. So some of the things that people are talking about, and again, this is reflective of very different contexts. Um, you know, one person is coming from a crisis intervention um, perspective, so the value is highly placed on, on that point of entry. Other people are talking about the goal as, um, getting survivors financially stable enough to be able to move from ha their, from the DV services housing to um, the survivors having their own um, housing. Um, some other folks are talking about um, their, um, you know, they're working within a legal services context, so family law and protection orders are valued, um, and, and this particular participant says that they're trying to move the needle on economic issues um, and that it's been a, somewhat of a challenging process. Um, and somebody else frames it in terms of empowerment on a bunch of different levels, survivors, social, cultural, economic, political empowerment. So I just, I find this extremely interesting and, you know, we can do an entire and many <laughs> um, webinars talking about this, but really um, in order for our work to be Im impactful and effective for survivors, we need to do a little bit of our own um, organizational clarification around, you know, how do we define success? 
And I think that that's what some of um, Katie's uh, questions here are really trying to get at. How, how is it that we're defining success? And um, because sometimes I think we may move forward on, on the definitions without really, or rather move forward on the outcomes without having very clear definitions. So good work to do there internally. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Erica, and I think this next slide kind of, I'm not going to talk much about it, but I feel, feel like it's something you can take back to your organization and spend some time thinking about it. What is our current state of programming and, and how are we doing this work? So, um, just looking at some of the ways that maybe we can shift a little bit, I'm going to share a little bit about my experience at Redevelopment Opportunities for Women, where within our protocols and strategic planning, um, our, our relationship with clients was very long term. There was real no, no real time frame for how long we could work with survivors. Um, four years was kind of a, a, maybe a standard or, or a mean of how long we would work with, with survivors. And we also saw that survivors would come to us from many different sources. So not only just other domestic violence organizations or referrals, but we worked very closely with homeless programs, with faith communities, and with community colleges so that we worked with survivors at many different places within their relationships, not just when they were deciding to leave or when they were kind of leaving for a uh, short term, but um, we worked with many survivors who were planning to stay long term with their partners and how to increase their economic security within the context of that relationship. We also um, had survivors come in through economic education that was placed within a structural and intersectional power analysis, so it really helped us frame the work that we were doing with survivors. We also um, had survivors come into us through economic education that was advertised for everyone. It wasn't just advertised for survivors of intimate partner violence. So we found that we connected with a lot of folks um, who were potentially um, safer saying to their partners that they were coming to a class to learn more about money than to, to disclose that they were that it was around domestic violence, and that probably 90 to 95% of the folks that ended up coming to us had experiences of partner violence at some point in their life, and so it was a good connection for them, but it was also a conduit for them to get services without necessarily um, saying that they were going to domestic violence. And we also really did work that was defined by the survivor and that was driven by the survivor's needs and priorities and with very flexible safety planning, recognizing that one week a survivor may prioritize their housing and the next week the priority may be dealing with a payday loan and really following what the survivor needed, using our expertise to enhance what they knew, building a partnership and looking at that all the time. So that's just one, one other example of maybe some different ways of doing things. So I'm excited now to turn over to um, Purvi Shah. She's going to talk about shaping survivor-centered um, ad economic advocacy for communities of color in indigenous communities. Great. Thank you so much, Katie and Sarah and Erica. It's such a joy to be on today. Um, and thank you all who are attending in terms of all of the work you do every day. I know the work that we do is difficult, challenging. There's so many barriers. So thank you not only for taking the time to be on this webinar today to see how you can expand the work, but also in the work that you're already doing. Congratulations. So I wanted to give a little bit of framework, and this is part of um, our continuing partnership with BSAJ in terms of thinking about particularly um, how race and um, other oppressions intersect with economic justice issues. So at Women of Color Network, where I serve as a consultant, we've been looking at economic policy and leadership issues for communities of color and indigenous communities and survivors because we know that economics are not equal and that our communities um, have an inequity in terms of economic justice issues. So in terms of some of the work that we have been doing, we've been trying to foster connections um, and, you know, really thinking about, again, just the broader landscape that women of color are underpaid. We know that, of course, there's a pay inequity generally, about 79 cents to the dollar now in terms of what women get to men. But, of course, when you look at um, break that down by race, we also see that, especially for African American, Latina, and Native women, that there is a huge disparity. And that also for Asian American women, there are disparities, particularly um, in comparison to white men and Asian American men, and then breaking it apart by whether one is an immigrant or refugee. So thinking about um, all of these contexts, we knew that we couldn't really serve survivors around economic justice without looking at the larger framework, which is 
um, you know, in some ways why some of our organizations, particularly culturally specific organizations, were formed, which is, one, that survivors are connected to communities, right, so that we are not living separate from our communities and that we also are part of our communities and that some of the ways in which the battered women's movement was structured historically may not have been culturally relevant or specific for communities of color and indigenous communities. So, for example, one of the ways in which we see that play out in the field is the heavy predominance of reliance on criminal justice systems as a response. So, as we know, for communities of color and indigenous communities, mass incarceration is a huge issue. And so, you know, survivors are routinely put in this context of, you know, can I access services? Can I not? Do I report? Do I not? And what is the impact that that may have on my family? on my community and also economically in all of those contexts. So we want to really honor the fact that survivors are connected to communities and that we can't address um, issues around survivors of violence without having that community co connection and making sure that we're looking holistically at what survivors need and communities need in terms of economic access. In that vein, and Katie brought this up, you know, gesture toward this earlier, but we really need intersectional solutions for intersectional oppression. So this is to say that we cannot think about economic justice issues for survivors without recognizing the historical context of our work here in America, which includes um, genocide of tribal people, stealing of land, includes slavery as an economic and political and social system to lead to disinherited wealth and gaps, or immigration and labor issues that really put people in vulnerable situations and having to work for less pay or being exploited. So those historical and active live contexts, the ways in which that legacy and also ongoing legacy and ongoing disproportionate equity has an impact in our communities is really crucial to understand. So when we think about our work, and again, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, we have to recognize that it's not about necessarily individual survivors and, you know, struggling around issues of poverty, but that this is a larger symptom of the fact that we are living in a country where economic inequity was part of the way in which um, it was founded. So that really, having that intersectional frame, um, really opens up then other ways of thinking about solutions. So for us, one concrete way that that recognizing this cross-section of oppression um, opens up, particularly around economic equity issues, different frames of solutions, is that it leads us to think about leadership development of grassroots grassroots advocates, i.e. that we are all thought leaders and that particularly survivors and advocates who are dealing with systems on a day-to-day -day basis have the expertise and know best what solutions there are, but we're not necessarily at policy tables. We're not necessarily in places where decisions are made that affect the day-to-day -day lives of survivors in our communities. So. In that vein, we really see that enabling policy reform, and this includes everything from sort of within programmatic um, areas, as we're talking about a lot today. It also includes within other institutions. It includes like what language access in the courts or other issues that we can think around. Um, and then it also includes the broad kind of sense of policy reform, legislative reform that folks often think about when you think about policy work. The way in which we see it, and particularly, again, with those two precepts of survivors being connected to communities and intersectional solutions for intersectional oppression, is that the work that we are doing is also building movement. It's building a movement for change, for equity, and enabling a society and context where we can say that poverty can no longer exist. So in that vein, the work that we're doing is both to serve individual survivors and to lift up our experience expertise, but also for the long-term vision change of having a community and society where every person is valued, that has that sense of dignity that Eric, Erica talked about, and also fundamentally has the capacity to be their full selves and has that opportunity. So the work that we're doing is part of that larger vision of movement change and building. 
So that's a really, really big kind of scope and scale, and we think that that scope and scale is necessary in terms of the work that we want to do. So on a very concrete level, some of the key impacts that I can speak to from the work that we have done um, at the Women of Color Network are um, about four things that are really clear. And there have been others, but I think I want to focus on these. And the work that we've been doing has included organizing convenings for advocates, um, both in terms of folks who work in the anti-violence movement, so all of you are on the line, but then also bringing in folks who work in economic justice and social justice movement. Because as we often say, one of our um, convening participants in the South, Marcia Olivo, who runs the Miami Workers Center, said this very profound thing um, just a couple of months ago at our Southern Regional Convening. She said, you know, we've been doing racial justice and economic justice work and have never put gender at the center even though all of this work is done by women. Yeah. And hearing that, we just had to kind of take in that information and just recognize, again, that our movements are often working in silos and that we're not necessarily able to bring our whole selves into the work. So one of our successes and impacts is that economic justice leaders have often then been able to, through the work with us, be able to see that they can also lead their work as survivors of violence, that they can also bring into the work that perspective as well and also connect it to the issues that they may be working on, whether it's immigrant workers' rights, whether it's about minimum wage, et cetera, so that these issues are connected. And then on the other side, for anti-violence advocates who often are, again, as some of you know um, and work in daily, you're sometimes very specialized into this is exactly what you should be doing, this is the scope of your work, and in some ways that enables efficacy, it enables us to, you know, really address particular situations, build up expertise, but what we lose is the opportunity to see how economic empowerment is central to advocacy and how we need to have that frame. So when we have convenings and we hear from folks who are doing work around organizing nail salon workers and then, you know, connecting that to reproductive justice and gender violence issues, it allows folks who are working in the anti-violence field to also see how, yes, these issues of workplace violence are also crucial to the work that we're trying to address, and they also impact the lives of survivors that we're working with. So if you have immigrant workers who are not getting paid effectively, that's a crucial piece of the work that needs to be done. And then you can, by hearing from folks who are working around economic justice movements, actually figure out strategies to partner, figure out ways in which the work can be happen together. So from that vantage point, you know, it is clear that, you know, the fight for 15 or work around minimum wage increase, that is intimately also connected to the work to end gender violence because survivors are often working in those contexts as well. The second um, impact that we've been able to have is that we've really been able to lift up and foster community-specific resources and approaches for addressing economic security and violence. So, for example, I had spoken earlier about mass incarceration, and so we know that this is an issue that disproportionately impacts communities of color. So when we spoke with advocates and community members and, you know, we heard folks talking about how, you know, sometimes maybe a tribal pardon would be a better solution or perhaps an alternative or some other kind of restorative justice mechanism is a better way to address situations. So, you know, in really thinking about this, opening up, like, what does healing mean? What does justice mean from a survivor's vantage point? And really enabling survivors to drive that conversation. Um, but that's been a great way in which, you know, community-specific resources and approaches have been able to be possible. And as Katie mentioned before, you know, when I was at SECI, uh, for South Asian women, our economic empowerment program also became an entry point for survivors to come. So for community members to come get computer classes or avail of grants that we might have had for educational opportunities, it became a way in which we could serve a broader segment of the community in terms of survivors of violence without folks feeling like they needed to come simply for legal services. So we're really actually reaching a wider segment of the population and a wider segment of folks who could benefit and also enable our longer vision um, by actually working in terms of threading economic justice through our work. Third, 
the, our work is really broadening the understanding of policy advocacy and change. So often in nonprofits, we get told, oh, you can't do lobbying. You can't do work um, that's, you know, around legislation. And in part of that, there are limitations. But policy advocacy is so much more than that. It's also enabling institutionally, like your courts or your legal services providers or other agencies, welfare offices, to behave and actually serve your community better and stronger. So the work that we've been doing, convening advocates and pooling expertise, has really enabled advocates to understand that, yes, I can actually, I'm a direct services crisis intervention staff member, but I can also do policy advocacy and change. And in fact, that's central to my job as well, that if I'm working around enabling better access at public benefits offices, then that too is part of the work of really enabling a stronger response for survivors. And then finally, the work that we're doing is really fostering an environment for a wider understanding of economic security. So again, in terms of our work, given that history and historical oppression and intergenerational trauma is really part of how we approach ending violence, we also see that economic equity and access is much broader. So it's also looking at, you know, police brutality issues. It's looking at context of treaties and colonialism in this country and being able to say that these are connected to gender violence and that also our solutions have to also address these issues simultaneously. So it's being able to mobilize worker centers to address gender, but also to enable gender violence organizations to actually address the situation of workers as part of the work that we're doing more broadly. So with our work, we're hoping not only, again, to be able to truly make our services relevant to our communities, but also in the bigger picture, create the society that we envision, which is one based on equity and dignity. So I know that's a lot of information, and you're probably thinking, how am I going to do this all? So I'm going to pass it back to Katie to help you think through some of the staff capacity issues. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm I'm going to um, talk a little bit about staff capacity, and I think we're going to go over the training really quickly. So in order to in increase staff capacity, it helps to really do training focus not just on one piece, but also both. So doing staff capacity training on um, survivor-centered advocacy, and you can look at this as, as a model, but also at, on economics and including everybody within that training. You can see on this slide here we have a number of tools that are available, past webinars, um, training tools that you can resource as you're trying to plan some staff training within your context. Um, and I also have an example here looking at one model within um, an organization called Cornerstone where they had really used a mentorship model within their organization where they had two staff members trained completely on economics who then used their knowledge to give information to other, and other advocates within the organization and they served as kind of this, um, this reference source and it got the other advocates within the organization so excited that they ended up asking for a two-day economic training within their whole organization and has broadened their economic work within their organization. So you can start small and start growing and building your organization, so um, survivor Center economic advocacy context. The other thing that is very important for staff capacity is supervision. So a lot of us in the, um, the world of doing domestic violence work, um, we know how busy it is and how overwhelming and exhausting it can be at times, and sometimes we don't make that space and time for um, supervision. But what I have found with working with staff who are doing survivor-centered economic advocacy work, the work becomes very broad, and, and in order to be sure that the advocate is not being directive or kind of hoping that a uh, survivor moves down a certain path or directing them or pushing them, even maybe subtly to do a certain thing, it really helps to have a supervisor who meets with that person weekly, intentionally, 
hopefully one-on-one -on -one, and hopefully um, for 30 minutes or more. And that, that supervisor can provide um, non-judgmental listening support and can also help that advocate or the lawyer really think about some, their self-assessment and what's going on for them. So for lots of us, as we start becoming um, more worried about a survivor or wanting different things for their lives, we start becoming more directive even when we're not wanting to be. So having that sounding board and that person looking at that thing, I wonder why that is happening here for you, what is, about, what is it about this issue that's kind of making it more difficult for you to be more survivor-centered around this? It also helps then the survivor uh, or the supervisor really guide the trainings that are provided within the organization because they can see kind of the challenges that the advocates or the lawyers are coming up against and also can help them with their policy work as they're doing, doing the work. So there's just some tips and tools on, on how to do that supervision as well. Um, another thing that's important to think about is the support within the organization for advocates, lawyers doing the work, recognizing that many of us are not receiving a living wage or maybe struggling economically for a lot of reasons, and looking at that within an organizational context, both how we can try to increase wages within our, within our context, but also to support survive, or, excuse me, advocates and um, lawyers that are doing the work to be able to have some economic education for themselves. So maybe by providing in-service training specifically for the advocates and staff to know in their own lives how to do some work like working on student loan debt that they might have when looking at retirement issues, home buying. Um, we also, within our organization, Redevelopment Opportunities for Women, would provide economic literacy classes specifically just for advocates so that the advocates could come, get it, and use it for their own lives, which then made them more comfortable in doing the economic literacy work with survivors themselves. From my experience, one of the biggest reasons that I think that doing this work is so important is that it helps survivors, but it also helps the advocates that are doing this work. For me, it, I found when I was doing this work as a, as a um, survivor-centered economic advocate supervisor, I found that the folks I was working with were less frustrated with their survivors. They were more hopeful about their chances. They were had an increased understanding of the role that, that they played in the survivor's lives, which then therefore made them happier with their jobs, made them feel like they were more engaged in the work that they were doing, that they had more, um, more power within the organization to change how we were thinking about things, how we were working on things, what trainings were important. And it really helped them become more more complex in their safety planning with survivors. Um, so we have a few slides also on um, building the partnerships, and I'm going to go through those quickly because I really want to take the time, the few seconds that we have left, to have um, Purvi and Erica share some examples of um, building diverse partnerships. Um, so, I mean, I had mentioned a little bit earlier in um, the webinar today, this is Erica speaking, <laughs> um, that um, the impetus for the consumer rights um, project really came from some of what we were seeing in um, convenings where um, I have a very um, clear memory of um, one time when I was sitting at a conference and the focus area was supposed to be around addressing the economic needs of, of the economic legal needs of survivors. And the room was literally split um, between on one side there were domestic violence advocates and lawyers, and on the other side of the room were seated consumer rights lawyers. Um, and um, it became very um, clear, um, both visually and um, substantively, that there is a real gap in terms of um, learning and coordination between um, the domestic violence advocacy community and the, um, and the consumer rights anti-poverty legal community. And so that really was sort of the impetus for a lot of the work um, that began um, and some of the work that we have very deliberately done with communities um, around some of some building partnerships. I guess I just want to toss out the example of the Texas Council on Family Violence, one of our demonstration sites, that um, in the first year of their pilot work, um, you know, saw the the importance of having to um, map out and create a infrastructure of 
that would provide consumer and anti-poverty legal advocacy to survivors. And so they did lots of groundwork on um, not only identifying who those folks were, who those critical partners were, um, but also cultivating relationships and knowledge um, between the, the two groups. Thank you, Erica. Um, I don't know, Kirby, um, yeah. I was just going to hand it over to Pervy to see if you wanted to speak a little bit about the um, that partnership Great. aspect. Yes, absolutely. So um, one, at one of our recent convenings, Grace Franklin, who is a co-founder of an organization called OKC Artists for Justice, spoke about mm -hmm. the ways in which, again, community, community members can be involved. So. Um, she is a native of Oklahoma City, and um, she, as an artist, organized um, a lot of community members to respond in terms of the Daniel Holtzcock case. So we know that this is one of the rare examples of a police officer being held accountable, um, and also in terms of assault on the job, and particularly in this case, an egregious case of um, identifying poor black women um, as targets for sexual violence and other kinds of violence. So in this um, context, I really wanted to lift up Grace's work, um, identifying primarily as an artist, but then really pooling others. Um, she and her co-founder um, really pooled other community members to look at why was this happening, to create a community response, to attend the hearings, to make sure that there was a representation and also to lay out the systemic issues, i.e. that folks in the east side of Oklahoma City have to cross town in order to get to sexual assault and domestic violence services. And to really, again, make those links, not just that they were, these were African-American women, but that there were poor African-American women, and that that economic context was a reason for the violence to be happening. So. She, along with other community members and organizing across, you know, folks within the community, organizing with other artists, organizing with agencies, really helped to lift up the issue. And, you know, this is one of those scenarios in which, again, um, a community response in parallel to a legal response. Um, has been something that we can really see that, yes, some measure of justice was served, if not fully. Thank you both. I think those examples are really helpful. And thank you all so much for um, listening today. And, and hopefully you have some good ideas and you can use some of the tips um, regarding the creating survivor Center economic advocacy organizations. Um, we have some great references and resources that hopefully you'll be able to utilize as you move forward. Um, and then if you have questions, I know that we have um, space for questions up here, but also feel free to email um, any of us through the Survivor Center Agency and Justice, and we're happy to um, follow up. I know there might be specific things that are for your organizational context that we weren't able to talk about today, or if you wanted to talk through some examples or get some more resources, we're really happy to talk with you at any time about any of those questions. Yeah, this is Sarah. I just want to echo that from Katie, that whether it's here as, as you're leaving, um, sending out some questions, or please also take advantage of the evaluation questions that are going to pop up for you once you exit here. Um, let us know what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, what you're doing, and ask any questions, and we'll make sure um, to follow up with you um, more specifically there. And also just to thank Katie and Torvi and Erica for their insights. I think ending on looking at diverse partnership really echoes the fact that, that when we're doing this, it um, diverse perspectives and articulations and um, of, of needs are important. Um, and really valuable and value adds rather than barriers um, to the work. And, and there are lots of, there's lots of creativity that comes out of that, which is why we're really excited um, to have both Katie and Corby share that with us today. So thank you both um, very much. Um, and we have a couple of announcements. I don't know if Erica has any final words as we um, quickly run through those as, as folks are invited to leave if you need. Um, I, I also am really thankful 
for um, Katie and Pervy's um, expertise and insights today and all of the good resources and also Sarah for your um, expertise on the assessment front. Um, there are, in this PowerPoint, which you'll receive later, lots of resources, um, both from CSAJ in terms of um, organizational assessment and um, community-specific economic work. Um, also, there are a bunch of really good resources from the Women of Color Network um, that I encourage you to take a look at um, and really underscore the importance of his, uh, you know, placing this economic work um, in the context of an anti-oppression framework and um, hopefully will inspire some new thinking um, in your own organizational work. Uh, I also want to um, just highlight a couple of upcoming events that we have. First, um, on the webinar front, on April 21st, we're hosting, uh, well, no, we are not hosting. We are participating in a webinar being hosted by Jewish Women International, um, where, where we will be focusing on economic justice for survivors and sort of the, the economic advocacy approach that, um, that we have articulated a little bit in some of our other webinars and certainly will be um, expanding upon in, in the upcoming atlas that I had mentioned earlier. That's happening April 21st. April 29th, we're having a webinar on coerced debt and debt defense for survivors. We're really excited about that particular webinar because it's an opportunity for building coalition amongst lawyers throughout the country now that are thinking critically about new strategies to address debt when it really is happening in a coercive context. Um, on May 5th, we are participating um, in a webinar hosted through Battered Women's Justice Project on um, using, using protection orders as a tool for accessing economic justice. June 22nd, we are focusing our webinar on housing foreclosure and defense for survivors, thinking at the intersection of foreclosure advocacy and um, the experience of domestic violence and um, poverty. So all of those coming up, and you should just keep your eyes open for some registration announcements. Um, lastly, before we um, all go in our different directions, I just want to um, uh, announce again, for those of you ha who have not yet gotten word of it, we're thrilled to be launching a new project through CSAJ, um, which is called the Legal Impact for Racial and Economic Equity of Survivors Project. Um, the Women of Color Network, um, for which Pervy consults, is a very large partner in this work and will um, be very um, intimately involved in helping to guide this work, along with many other partners, which are listed at the bottom of this slide. But really, the focus of um, this project is to address the systemic barriers to economic justice that face survivors of color. Um, and we're thrilled about engaging in this work with um, communities um, throughout the country. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can hop onto our website or send us an email. So thank you everybody for um, participating today. We're looking forward to hearing about um, your experiences with today's uh, webinar. We wanna hear your thoughts because we will be expanding on this in the future and we always love to hear about your work. So thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, Pervy, and thank you, Katie and Sarah. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you all, have a great day. Thank you.